Um, my name is Angela Sierra. I'm an attorney at the California Department of Justice, D Justice with our Division of Operations. I was the former Chief of the Public Rights Division, and I'm Attorney General Javier Becerra's representative on the RIPA board, and am a co-chair on this subcommittee for calls for service. Um, I just wanted to take a moment um, to thank and to note that on behalf of the California Department of Justice, we want to convey our deep appreciation to all the members of the RIPA board and members of the public who are participating in today's subcommittee meeting. Um, I think as we all know, the work of the subcommittee and the RIPA board is more important now than ever. Um, George Floyd's family, our communities, our country as a whole, we are in such pain right now. And George Floyd's tragic and unacceptable death and other recent events have brought so many societal wounds to the forefront. We are, as we all know, in a pivotal time in our history. So for all of us in law enforcement on this board and elsewhere, um, we really need to open our hearts and minds as never before, as we listen to all those who are speaking out against the use of force by law enforcement. We also need to even more deeply engage with each other in our communities to come up with meaningful systemic solutions. So as we honor the memory of George Floyd and we work together to seek justice, we need to find a path forward as we reckon with our past. And so again, on behalf of the Department of Justice, we wanna thank everybody participating here today um, for being part of this critical work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Angela. My name is Sandra Brown. Um, my, uh, I have 30 years in law enforcement. I retired as a lieutenant with the city of Palo Alto about 11 years ago. I uh, was asked to join this board and I'm very proud to be part of it. And my thoughts and prayers mirror Angela's, but I must say it is time. It is time. This has been the most, the most disappointing week, if not two weeks, based on the death of an American citizen on national television. We have to do something. We cannot just stand by and watch this happen. My heart, my thought, my heart goes out to all the family members of those that have died under racial tension in this country and what has been going on. And I'm not making a, a political statement, but we are all Americans and we really must think forward and not back and change what's been happening. Um, in, my, uh, in my experience with law enforcement, I swore to protect property and lives over my 30 years. And I just put forth to say that I promise to stand up when met with illegal, immoral, and unjustified acts by members of my own profession. We need to be able to say that and we need to be able to be held to that because this is a war between people that I'm supposed to protect and serve. And evil comes from all di directions. And as a police officer, a former police officer, sometimes I have to look next to myself standing to make sure that the people that I protect to serve in uniform are also protecting the people that we're supposed to serve. This is a very important time, and I'm sorry to take up this time, but I'm very passionate about it, and we need to make some changes. Thank you for the opportunity, and I appreciate being on this board. Anybody else? Hi, my name is Sah Oh, go, go ahead, Sheriff Robinson. No, 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 I, no, no go ahead, Sahar, go ahead. No worries. Okay, my name is Sahar Durali. I am a, a co-chair of the RIPA board through the end of this year, and I work at Neighborhood Legal Services of Los Angeles, which is legal aid in the northern part of Los Angeles County as an associate director of litigation and policy. Hi, everybody. Dave Robinson, Kings County Sheriff um, in the Central uh, Valley of California representing the uh, California State Sheriff's Association. And uh, I, won't, I won't go into a lengthy comments just to say that, uh, you know, I, I haven't come across anyone in law enforcement who isn't saddened by uh, the events in Minnesota. And it's, it's, it's just tragic. And, and 
you know, we're ready um, as a law enforcement community. We're absolutely, absolutely ready to uh, engage and, and uh, accept changes um, because you can see, you know, in, in the video um, of what did occur that it should have never occurred. And that is, that's not our training. None of us have ever been trained like that. And, and I think the uh, prosecutors definitely got it right. Um, when they filed charges because nobody's ever been trained that way and, and uh, the human nature side of that is just uh, makes it even worse. And so, you know, our uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to his family as well. And, and I'll keep my comment short because I know it's a long meeting, but uh, law enforcement is definitely ready as well. Thank you. Should we, I know we um, want to move so we can hear from our panel. So um, I will make a motion to approve the subcommittee minutes from the um, October 22nd meeting. I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. Thank you. And so, Allison, um, do you want to um, introduce the um, the overview of the um, post subcommittee work? Yes, thank you. Um, so, thank you everyone for joining, and thank you members of the public as well. Um, we look forward to hearing your public comment. Um, we are, this meeting, because we did not have a March meeting because of COVID-19, um, we had this uh, wonderful panel plans um, that we're very excited about. Um, we have uh, a, on mental health and law enforcement community interactions. Um, we put this panel together um, after the board expressed um, an interest back in December in really exploring this issue. Um, we were seeing some disparities in the data um, and the board and members of the public advocates um, were very interested in hearing more about this issue. Um, and this is, so instead of having it, because we could not have it at the March meeting, we have moved it to the subcommittee meeting because we still think it's a really important issue that we want to address. And so, um, I'm going to let Aisha introduce the panel. Um, and then after the panel, we'll have a discussion of what the board wants to see in this report in the calls for service section. And it can be relevant to what you're hearing, what you're about to hear in the panel. Um, it can be other ideas. You know, last uh, in the last year's report, we talked about, calls for service and bias by proxy and ideas for questions that dispatchers and others could ask and, and some best practices around that. Um, but there's a lot of room for really what the board wants to make this section, what you want to include in this section. And so that's what we're going to talk about later in the meeting. Um, and we really welcome your thoughts on that because really we have, we have time to explore uh, what people feel is important to get into in this section um, and given that um, you know we we are still you know in the first half of the year um, there's you know and we're going to have further subcommittee meetings and we have time to do work on drafts as well um, there's definitely room for creativity and areas of interest that the board might have that are relevant to bias by proxy and calls for service um, so with that, I'll turn it to Aisha, who's going to introduce this. Oh, Sandra, did you have a question? Or, okay. <laughs> um, I'll turn it over to Aisha, uh, who is going to introduce the panelists today. Okay, good morning, everyone. We've got um, a great panel this morning. And as um, uh, everyone has said, the board is interested in lots of areas um, that deal with community and law enforcement and where they intersect. And so today um, we've got a panel that is going to deal with uh, or share mental health and law enforcement and community interaction. 
Uh, one of our speakers was not able to attend. He was um, called off and deployed for the uh, protest. Uh, just, just be on call. And his name is Detective Charles Dempsey. And I just want to say just a couple words about him. Um, he is the officer in charge of the LAPD Administrative Detailed Mental Evaluation Unit and Crisis Response Support Section. He has over 28 years of law enforcement, and he's combined his psychiatric nursing experience with his present profession in law enforcement. So we're, we're sorry that he could not be here today, but we certainly understand. Um, and he um, uh, submitted several documents that you can find on the website, and I think we will give you a link as well. One is the Los Angeles Police Department Mental Evaluation Unit um, 911 Checklist, a law enforcement mental health learning site, and um, uh, another document that gives the timeline for the work that's been done by LAPD to try to bridge uh, mental health experts with their work as they deploy officers. So we regret, regret that Detective Dempsey could not be here today, but hopefully he might be able to come back for a future meeting. And then we have Emily Lyle. Emily is on the call. She, you will be hearing from her. She's a licensed clinical social worker and mobile evaluation team supervisor with the Kern County Behavioral Health and Recovery Services. Emily has worked in the behavioral health field for the past 15 years uh, and met the uh, mobile evaluation team is a crisis intervention unit that is dispatched by current law enforcement agencies to the scene of a situation that um, her staff and team are very valuable um, working with those kinds of calls. So, um, and Emily is also the co-chair of the Kern Crisis Intervention Team. So, um, we are really fortunate to have Emily with us today to be able to take the time to share with the board. And then our um, next speaker is Vinny Ng. And Vinny Ng is a community organizer and mental health advocate based in San Francisco. And his activism, the impetus of his, act, his advocacy has come out of a personal experience that he will share with you. He has served on the Mental Health Advisory Working Group for San, the San Francisco Police Department since 2013. He's, uh, he works on the use of force policy reform, which was a huge issue, not only in San Francisco, but in the state, but throughout the nation. He has worked on building effective civilian oversight bodies and developing alternative first responder protocols. And one more note about Vinny. In 2019, he was named a Food and Wine Magazine Sommelier of the Year. So uh, with that, I'd like to um, turn it over to um, uh, Emily and the board and both speakers will, will We'll give a presentation and then um, invite the board to have an interactive discussion. And then following that, we will have time for public comment. Okay, thank you. Good morning to the members of the board and the public who are listening in. Um, this is, you know, very new for me being COVID um, protocol and being online as opposed to being in person. So bear with me. I think I'm getting used to the kind of the new normal with all the meetings. Um, I feel very fortunate to be a part of the panel today and be talking with you all. Um, so I'm going to start by going over a little bit of my history. I know um, Aisha already shared some of that. I'm going to share a little bit more. And then I'm going to start talking about the different areas of our crisis intervention team, including our mobile evaluation team, and how we are able to really coordinate with our local law enforcement agencies in Kern County to help not only divert people from the judicial system to treatment, but also how we assist in the training and further development of law enforcement officers who are in the field 
um, in order to try to have better outcomes overall for our people with disabilities that we're seeing on a daily basis. So as Aisha mentioned, I've been in mental health for the past 15 years. I have been supervising our mobile evaluation team for the last seven. Um, so prior to the mobile evaluation team and prior to me becoming a licensed clinical social worker, I did a lot of work in the field. I worked with children and families. I worked with adults um, across the spectrum from very high functioning and low level disabilities to very low functioning and a high level of disabilities. Um, and so with that work came getting to know our community better, the different challenges that we face in our communities. Um, you know, Kern County, as most of you probably know, has a very expansive geographic layout. We have over 8,160 plus square miles to cover as a Kern, uh, as a county behavioral health plan. And so when I became the supervisor of the mobile evaluation team, it became quite apparent that one of our challenges was going to be, how do you work with limited staff um, which have ranged from eight MET staff to 12 to 13 MET staff to cover all of Kern County, to work with all of Kern's law enforcement officers. Um, you know, the, the mobile evaluation team started 22 years ago in Kern County. And when they started, they started with a briefcase and a pager. Um, I don't know how many of you remember having pagers, um, but that's what they had. And they would, there was one to two people and they would take turns rotating the pager in the briefcase. Um, and that's the point where our current behavioral health system started actively engaging and working with law enforcement in Kern County. Um, and I, our current director, Bill Walker, um, was the crisis services administrator at the time. And the mobile evaluation team was his brainchild, so to speak. Um, and he still talks about the challenges it was to, to start developing that relationship with law enforcement, um, which now, I, I listened to him and others in our department who helped start this team, and I can't imagine what that would have been like because at this point in time, our relationship with our law enforcement agencies in Kern is very strong. Um, we have a lot of respect for each other. Um, we're not afraid to call each other and ask questions or review cases that we felt could have been better. And so as far as our relationship and coordination with law enforcement goes, it's great um, at this point in time in Kern County. Now, as, as far as the calls for service go specifically, I think there are, are a lot of different areas I could touch on that either directly or indirectly end up affecting the calls for service specifically. Um, my team responds to between 2,600 to 3,000 calls for service per year. Um, two thirds of those calls are with adults, a third are with minors. Um, and over the years, the relationship that was built between behavioral health and law enforcement allowed for us to get to the point where law enforcement has us on their dispatch system. So instead of calling us on a telephone or, or paging us or any other type of communication, all of my MET staff have call signs. I'm MET1. So in the morning, if I'm going to take calls, I get on the radio and I log on as MET1. Um, so <clears throat> I think a very important part of us communicating via the radios and dispatch is that one, Dispatch always knows where my staff are, if they're safe, 
Um, if for some reason they're not responding to the radios, I'm getting a phone call immediately saying, hey, uh, one of your MET staff, and they'll call them by their call sign, is not responding to the radio or cell phone. Um, we need to find them. Um, and of course, that's a safety issue. And so we take care of that. And I appreciate that when they do that. Another a positive thing about us being on the radios is we're able to hear when we're needed. Um, and when I say that, you know, dispatch will request one of us. It, and I'll get more into how the process works. However, if we're sitting at our desk and we're all logged on to the radio, that means we're listening to the traffic on the radio. We're listening to the calls coming through. We're listening to the dispatchers explain what the reporting party is reporting. Um, sometimes we recognize the addresses. If, if it's a room and board or a board and care or some type of facility for individuals with disabilities, Sometimes if a name is mentioned, we recognize the name. We know that they're open to an outpatient service provider. Um, and in those instances, we're able to get on the radio and put ourselves en route to that call to go assist. Um, so I think that just being connected and hearing what's going on is a, a major positive um, for our our coordination. Um, I'm taking a look at some of my notes here because I don't want to skip past anything. Um, two other things that we've implemented in Kern County um, is we've been doing the crisis intervention team training, the 40 hour training for the last 10 years. Um, we provide at least three to four rounds of that training per year. Um, our our sheriff in Kern County, Sheriff Youngblood, has has made it um, mandatory that all of the new academies graduating receive this as their last 40 hours of training prior to graduating, um, which is great. Um, not only is the CIT training, you know, most people when they hear crisis intervention team, they automatically think of the 40 hour training. But many of you probably know and are familiar with the fact that the crisis intervention team model um, came from Memphis, Tennessee, and it was the result of a seriously and persistently mentally ill man being killed by law enforcement officers. Um, and, you know, the group rallied together and said, what can we do to fix this? It was a grassroots movement. NAMI was at the head of that. Um, they got law enforcement involved. They got the judicial, the whole judicial system was involved in this process. And now what we're focused on is we, you know, we did a whole sequential intercept map project in Kern County to really focus on where are gaps in services and how can we fill these gaps so folks aren't falling through them. And so we've been working on that and, and starting the full CIT program has really helped. And through that program, we were able to start a few different programs. One of them is a co-response team where we have one of my met staff actually riding in the vehicle with law enforcement officers. We have a county team and a city team. So we have two of those who work on two special projects. And we were also able to put into place Smart 911. And I'm not sure if you guys have heard about Smart 911, but it's a special call registry. And it's completely voluntary. It's free to anyone in the public. Um, and what it does is it provides dispatch with information immediately regarding any special circumstances going on in your home. So the way it works is you enter in a phone number, that phone number is connected to your address, and when you call 911 from that phone number that's registered with them, all of that special information populates for dispatch. So they're able to provide that to the officers 
and they have that information as they're responding. So, you know, if there's a medical condition, if there's a behavioral health condition, um, if you have dogs or cats in your home, I mean, people include pictures of their animals. Um, and so that's another area that through our crisis intervention team program, we were able to put that into place and that also helps in responding to calls for service. So specifically in regards to the mobile evaluation team and being on the same dispatch system as our law enforcement officers, I can tell you, I have a story that I like to use as an example. Um, I have a, um, a Hispanic staff member, his name is Geronimo. I hope he doesn't mind that I'm using his um, case as an example. Um, and I like to take pride in knowing that he is a very culturally competent and effective member of our MET team. Um, not too long ago, there was an, a situation that occurred where he was sitting in the office waiting for a call um, and working on some other projects and notes and things like that. And he heard a call come across the radio and it was for a middle-aged Hispanic male, Spanish speaking only. Um, he was suicidal. He was uh, floridly psychotic um, and there were no available Spanish-speaking officers to respond to the call. Um, Geronimo knew by the, the voices and the tone and the rate of speech over the radio that the situation was getting, I don't wanna say out of control, but it was getting very serious and acute and the the officers on scene were concerned that the subject was not gonna put the knife down. Um, and so he heard that going on and he got on the radio identifying himself and indicating that he was also a Spanish speaker and felt that you know he could be of use in that situation. Um, he responded to the call um, and what he came upon was, you know, the family members had been taken to a safe spot um, and there were officers surrounding him trying to keep him safe and everyone else safe. Um, but my staff said that he could tell that the client or the subject felt like he was being backed up against a wall, basically. Um, and so, he was able to speak with the law enforcement officers on scene and take the lead role in, in talking with him and, and trying to get him to put the weapon down. And he was able to do that. Um, he said it took him about 15, 20 minutes. Um, but, you know, that situation could have been much different would we not have had access to listening to the calls on the radio? Number two, if he wouldn't have been Spanish speaking, um, it's so important to have bilingual folks and, and not only Spanish obviously, but so important to have a culturally competent team. Um, and so that's one, one story I like to share that really illustrates that having a good connection and not only the connection, but also the relationship with the officers where they trust you. They trust that you know how to do your job as a behavioral health professional and that if they turn you on to the, the primary negotiator or they say, yes, go ahead and take this call, they can trust that you're going to do a good job and you're going to be helpful. And um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions or 
I mean, I could talk about my team all day. <laughs> I'm very proud of them and the work they do. But I really want to be as useful as possible and provide you as the board with and, and the public listening in with as much information as possible. Emily, this is Sandra Brown. Yeah. First, first of all, thank you. I have never in my travels throughout this country, and I have worked on this entire continent, heard anything like this. So I have a couple of questions. When we talk about you signing in on the police radio uh, at the beginning of your shift, uh, and each team member, met one, met two, and so forth, is there combined training with the individual agency so that the officers on site notice who the person is that they know who they are? Do they wear uniforms, or is there something that identifies them from just any other citizen that's walking up? Great question. So there are a few different ways that we approach that. Um, one of those ways is yes, recently in the last five years, we have started wearing a uniform. Our uniform has our first name and our call sign underneath that. So mine says Emily and then under it, it says met one. Um, so that's one way we're approaching that because as time goes on, we have a lot of officer turnover. We have a lot of new officers coming on the street and being in the past, we thought it was more client friendly per se to wear plain clothes. However, where that becomes problematic is when you show up on the scene of a potentially very dangerous situation and no one knows who you are. So we had to kind of weigh that um, decision, and in the end, we did decide to go with uniforms. Okay. Another way that we are addressing this, which is becoming more convenient and appropriate now that we have this pandemic going on, is the way that we used to do law enforcement briefings. So my team would go to each law enforcement agency in Kern County at least once per quarter, give updates to any 5150 law changing, give updates to any changes in our um, department's structure or our processes and how we function. Well, that became very taxing on the staff's time because a lot of the shifts at the law enforcement agencies resulted in a lot of overtime for my staff and they need their good rest and self-care. Um, so a great idea came from one of our city police lieutenants and he was like, hey, you know, we have a lot of officers, they work a lot of shifts. Have you guys ever thought about doing like 30 second to two minute videos? We could do email blasts across the entire department it would be more efficient for your, you, your staff, your time. Um, and not only that, if, if an officer is out sick on vacation, they will always have that email. Um, and so that's another thing. We recently filmed a kind of meet the mobile evaluation team. We each talked a little bit about ourselves and our, our experience and and what draws us to this type of work specifically, because it is a special niche to work crisis. Um, and so that's another way we've, um, we're have we trying to keep everyone aware of who we are, what we're about. Um, and of course, the number one way is through providing the services and responding to the calls for service alongside the officers. That's how they really get to know everyone. And that's excellent. And I know there's, I only have one other question. How, how are you funded in times of budget issues that we're looking at for agencies, especially since all this stuff is going on with COVID and so forth? How are you funded? Who pays, who pays the rent? Right. So that does come from a couple different directions. Most of it is through our general behavioral health fund. Um, mm -hmm. which is uh, dollars pulled down from the state level. Um, however, we also are a fee-for-service 
um, department. So whereas other departments may be affected in our county because they're general funded and it all comes from the big pot at the county level, um, mm -hmm. we actually are billing insurance companies for the services we're provided. Um, and so, you know, Medi-Cal, private health insurance, um, because when my staff provides a crisis intervention, we are using evidence-based practices. Um, there's an assist model. It's uh, applied suicide intervention skills training. Um, there are many different models of evidence-based practices that my staff are using to intervene. Um, and the other type of funding, my two co-response team members who ride along with law enforcement, those monies actually came from our community corrections partnership from AB 109. And a part of the reason they're funded through that, um, that the AB 109 funds is because of the special program they run. And I'm not sure, do you want me to talk a little bit about the programs they run? Uh, uh, that might be somebody else's question. I don't want to take up time. Okay. But okay. I, I, I think this is smart. This is really smart and I like it and I like to see it go out throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Um, hey, Emily, I ha also have a question. So when you say you're a fee for service model, are you charging to the, um, the caller's insurance? How does that work? How are you billing to the insurance companies? Right, so that happens. All of the the details to that I wouldn't have the answers to. Our billing department would. However, um, what I can tell you is, in the past, um, we didn't bill, um, but then it became it came from the state that um, if we're going to bill some clients, we have to bill all clients, and so. Yes, sometimes it is not the individual who is experiencing the behavioral health crisis who's calling 911 and putting into motion a response from law enforcement and my team. Um, sometimes it's a neighbor, right? And that was something that my team was concerned about in the beginning when we found out that all um, all services would be billed is that, you know, our clients aren't always the ones who are putting that call into motion. Um, how does that work? So what we've come up with, our billing department now has a way that we can, a fee waiver um, in essence, that we can help our clients fill out um, so their fee for the crisis intervention is waived. And ultimately, if the individual calls the billing department and is unable to provide uh, the payment, they will waive that as well. Angela, we can't hear you. It says you're muted there... still. Yeah, so maybe just taking yourself off mute. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I just tried. To, I'm not able to take Angela off mute. Um, Angela, if you did want to put it in the chat box, if you can't unmute yourself, uh, one of us can read it for you. Um... <laughs> So at the top of your screen is a, uh, are you able, audio is on. I think Angela, I think reading lips might be that you were going to put it in the chat and we can, um, someone else said try star four, to see if that helps unmute yourself.
Okay, are there any other questions that I could answer or any areas specifically I could expand upon for you all? Perhaps if we I can think... get An Angela up a little later, we can come back to it. Sure. Yeah. I have a question, and I, I apologize if you covered this and I missed it, but is the system structured so that there's always somebody on call from your team? Because, I, you know, I, I used to work in Kern County. I know how big it is. So are, are there instances in which um, you guys miss calls because you're short-staffed? Like, how does that work? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that. Um, we actually miss many calls every day. Um, I think we could have a team of 30 to 40 people and probably still miss calls every day. Um, so one way we address that is with a virtual MET program where we connect like this um, with outline areas um, that we were able to get through a grant. Um, which I didn't even touch on that, but um, we do have a virtual MET program to reach the outline areas. Um, and during this time of the pandemic, we've also been able to put those iPads within our hospital emergency rooms to where we can respond to those calls without having to increase the potential exposure of the MET staff um, and their families. Um, but in regards to our staffing patterns specifically, um, right now we are currently functioning from 7 a.m. to 12.30 a.m. every day. Starting this Saturday, the 6th, um, we're going to have 24-7 coverage. Um, and that is not only 24-7 coverage via a virtual connection, that means we will actually have someone on site ready to respond to calls in person 24 seven. Um, now, I do wanna say that for the current time, it'll be working kind of as a pilot to see how many calls come in during those hours that we typically didn't have anyone working. So a, a pilot somewhat. Um, so it will be limited with just one person on but I think if the numbers continue to show what they have in the past, that our team will be very busy, even during the nighttime hours. Um, throughout the rest of the days, our staff work Saturday through Tuesday and Tuesday through Friday, 10 hour shifts. Um, Tuesday is our overlap day, so we can hold a staff meeting in the afternoon when the afternoon shift comes in. But we typically have between four to six working per day. Got it. Yeah, I was just asking because part of what the subcommittee is charged with is coming up with, you know, recommendations and staffing is something that's really important, right? Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I find the hardest part of staffing our mobile evaluation team is finding folks who want to work the shift work who also have the experience that is required to fill the position um, because oftentimes when you get to a point in your life where you have the experience and the skills it takes to work this job you're wanting more of a schedule that you want right something that's accommodating to you um, and so that, you know, it is a difficult position to hire for. That makes sense. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. Thank you. So, Emily, would, are you going to stay online just in case Angela comes back? Awesome. Yes, Thank I will. You. I will be here. Thank you. Aisha, are you still on? So, Vinny, hi. Yes, uh-huh. Yes. Uh okay, so sorry. Now we can go ahead. Uh, if the board has no other questions for Emily, let's, um, let's move on to uh, Mr. Ng. Okay. Thank you, Emily. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, oh, wait, hi, sorry. Before, before we go to Vinny, this is Nancy. Um, would Angela like to call my phone and I could put it through um, for Emily or or Allison's phone? Oh, there she is. 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, great. Okay. I'm sorry that this happened, but I don't want to interrupt anymore. So you guys can go ahead and continue. Thank you. Angela, go ahead and ask your question because Emily's um, finished and then we're going to start with Vinny. Okay, and um, thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Emily. And um, I apologize if while I was trying to log on and off, these have already been um, answered or asked. So um, I had a couple of questions. One was about the SMART 911 um, number that you had talked about. And um, is that countywide and or is that broader? And um, in your experience, is it widely known in the community that that is um, an available service and is it widely used? Great question. So our county, it is countywide. It's actually across the US um, and many places have it. Um, mm -hmm. Our county was able to get it through our crisis intervention team, we had a subcommittee that kind of talked about responding to calls for service and how can we make sure the first responders are more equipped. And, and referring to first responders also including fire, right, for the medical mm -hmm. calls. Yeah. And so we were able to use MHSA innovation funds um, to start this project. And it, in, it includes our Kern County Fire Department, our Kern County Sheriff's Office, our Bakersfield City Police Department, Behavioral Health. Um, and so they, I'm, I'm no longer, I was a part of the implementation team because I was one of the co-chairs of our crisis intervention team program. At this point in time, I'm no longer involved um, my crisis services administrator, so my supervisor remains involved in that. But our public information officer for our department has done a lot of background work with the other organizations, um, information officers to get, we've done a lot of advertising in the community. I mean, we pushed this out a year or two ago now, and we are still doing billboards and bus wraps and commercials. And so we are still, and I wish I had the data for you. Um, I mean, we're during, since the COVID pandemic started, we've had a lot more people signing up for accounts because that's something that the, the ongoing evaluation committee for the SMART 911 project looks at is how many new people are signing up. Thank you. And I had another question about, um, you had mentioned that while your team listening to the dispatch calls, if I understand it correctly, there may be instances where you can kind of reroute the call. And if you could talk a little bit about that, is that, would that be that it no longer there will be a response from law enforcement, but there may be a response from another agency, or is it just, is it also, is it law enforcement would respond, but it's bringing in another agency or other um, service providers to assist? Yeah, that's a great question because I kind of veered off track a little bit with talking about the specific process or protocol that we follow in response to the calls for service. So basically when there's a, a MET staff available to, to respond, you know, when an, when an law enforcement officer gets to the scene of a call and they start recognizing signs, either behavioral or symptom wise that, you know, this might be someone who has a behavioral health um, mm -hmm. issue. They have, it's their discretion to request one of us. And okay. they don't, they don't have to use my team. Um, it's up to them to determine, is this something I can, you know, effectively deal with on my own and get a good outcome, whether that means, you know, talking to them until they verbally de-escalate or taking mm -hmm. them to our crisis unit or our crisis walk-in center, um, because our 
behavioral health has a great, really strong crisis services division with a lot of available crisis interventionists. Um, so a lot of the officers are aware of the different resources and services we have available. And sometimes mm -hmm. they feel like they can be just, just as effective in dealing with that. Um, however, if, if we're listening to the radio and we hear a call and we recognize the address or they mention the name of the person, we can get on the radio and say, you know, I would say control to met one, show me en route to, and then the address. And then that would let the officers on scene know, oh, we have a MET unit en route. Um, and, you know, they could or could decline to use us, to, you know, once we get there. But due to our, um, due to HIPAA, you know, we are allowed to release the least amount of information possible to help effectively intervene in a crisis situation. And so even if we're helping provide a little bit of um, information or background or how could you best intervene, um, we will do that. We will do whatever we can do to help on the call. Um, and you know, there are also some times when we know that they're responding to an individual who um, they have a treatment team, um, they're engaged with their treatment team, and maybe the call isn't really warranted or justified. Maybe what the caller is reporting isn't true. And if we're aware of that, absolutely, we will try to intervene as quickly as possible and help reroute those officers to a, a more urgent call. Um, but that is also what one of our co-response teams works on specifically, and it's referred to the as the high utilizer program. And we, we meet monthly with the dispatch, one of the dispatch supervisors, who keeps a list of the individuals who are calling and making false reports that they believe may have some type of behavioral health issue. Um, this program has been very effective and the numbers have, of calls have dropped significantly. Um, and that is one of the programs that's funded through AB 109 um for our co-response teams to continue providing um currently our city co-response team provides the high utilizer program um we don't have the staffing for the county for the sheriff's office to provide that program yet um initially when we ran the numbers to evaluate whether they would need the program or not for the county um there were so many that and they they covered all of the outlying areas i mean they have a vast area to cover that hopefully at some point we'll we'll be able to build up a high utilizer program for the county as well thank you very much you're welcome thank you so much again emily and um just for everyone's um information, Emily has also provided uh, a handout materials that are on the website and we'll provide the link for um, that provides more information about her program. Emily, again, thank you. And now we'll hear from um, Mr. Ng. Good morning. Thank, thank you, Emily, that for your, for your expert uh, and wisdom. Um, expertise and wisdom. Um, good, mor good morning. I am um, going to read from some prepared remarks as, as uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit hard to organize a lot of my thoughts around these issues, but um, I wanted to thank the community members throughout California who are listening in today um, with a special thanks to the board members, Sandra, Angela, and Sahar, as well as um, uh, Sheriff Dave Robinson, um, the Attorney General and his staff uh, for engaging me in this process. Um, I live in San Francisco, um, as Aisha mentioned, and I want to um, make clear that any comments or views shared today are solely my own. I, I'm not affiliated with any organization. Um, and of course, before I proceed, I, I want to make it unequivocally clear that Black Lives Matter. Um, 
I speak as a brother to Jasmine Ha Eng and as an advocate for compassion and community restoration. L like I mentioned, I have no specific affiliation, uh, but I do have a deep affection for the families of thousands of Californians and tens of thousands of Americans who have lost a loved one to police violence. My sister Jasmine was killed on January 4th, 2012 in a tragic encounter during a call for service. While experiencing mental crisis, four LA Sheriff's deputies responded to a non-emergency call involving my sister. This took place in the lobby of a mental health facility where Jasmine was a known patient. Negligence and choices made out of general order protocols resulted in her very preventable death. This all transpired in under 12 minutes from when the call was placed and the actual physical interaction between Jasmine and the four deputies took place in under two minutes. Um, I believe that in order for us to move our communities forward, we must advance dignity for individuals impacted by police violence. They have to be centered and their families have to be centered in policy formation. Legislators, policy, police executives, and policymakers may debate the merits of updating legal standards, but community members must be centered every step of the way to ensure that those standards evolve towards justice, which will always align more closely with the community's standards. For advocates like myself, our participation in these policy efforts are an attempt to prevent the unspeakable from happening to other families. Ask any survivor of police violence, any relative of someone who has died due to police use of force, what we want the most, second to our loved ones still being alive, is to prevent any other individual or family from going through the trauma that we live with on a daily basis. Many of us also want to make sure that your officers are not subject to unnecessary and preventable trauma. In 2013, I volunteered to join a working group of organizers, community groups, service agencies, lawyers and policymakers in San Francisco to advocate for long overdue changes to training programs, departmental general orders, use of force policies and accountability measures to reduce these tragic outcomes. This is really important to note. Communities and impacted families were included at the beginning of this cycle of a reform process, not the end. By 2016, we were able to operationalize a crisis intervention team program based on models used in Memphis and Seattle, but they were uniquely engineered for San Francisco. Tragically, by the time this was fully operationalized, we had seen far too many shootings and deaths in San Francisco. The opera operationalization of this CIT program coincided with a number of other really important reforms, including an overhaul of the use of force policy that led to a more restrictive policy. Um, officers were required to de-escalate by using time and distance, two tactics would, which would have saved my sister's life. And the legal standard was changed from reasonable to necessary, which is now codified in California by AB, 2, AB 290, uh, 392. Um, in 2018, the department also implemented a new policy requiring 100% of their officers be trained on understanding the spectrum of force options available to them. To date, over 53% of SFPD officers have completed 40 hours of crisis intervention team training on top of the 100% of the officers who have completed a 10 hour spectrum of force options training program. All 10 police stations have at least one if not two sergeants on on duty at any time who are CIT trained, who are liaisons with dispatchers, um, and dispatchers can route crisis calls immediately to them for team intervention. Combined, these efforts have led to a 30% reduction in use of force and an increase in officer safety. San Francisco went nearly 20 consecutive months without a single police shooting. Suffice to say, this is a floor, not a ceiling. The baseline for law enforcement shouldn't just be that civilians don't experience violence, but that, but that we build better models to get individuals the health care that they actually need. These care providers must be community and health-based and not in jails. And sometimes this may also mean that law enforcement may not necessarily be the point of first contact. As it is in the interest of this board to understand the role of profiling in relation to mental health disabilities, Please understand that until we establish pro protocols that dismantle ableist perspectives, no amount of data collection will eliminate the pervasive danger 
that people with mental health disabilities live with every day. These dangers are compounded whenever they and their care providers come into contact with law enforcement officials. My own sister was killed by a field training deputy. It was common for dispatch transcripts to include descriptors such as crazy or loon. This verbally dismissive moniker inherently establishes a tacit acceptance of identity profiling long before an officer is dispatched to a call for service, virtually eliminating any possibility for an outcome that comes close to feeling safe. Many of the individuals who have a diagnosis of a mental disability don't often exhibit physical expressions of that. Mental disabilities are often invisible to the human eye. So the data that purports to um, establish, you know, may, a percentage of officer identified mental disabilities may actually be higher than what is reported. Even casual remarks may pre-indicate bias in tactical considerations. Law enforcement executives must make clear to the, their departments that these microaggressions are not meeting the professional standards of the agency they run. That is why it's important that this committee establish and train to an appropriate spectrum of dispatch codes shared by all law enforcement agencies covered by this board. In San Francisco, when I first started advocating for de-escalation, dispatchers were working primarily with two dispensation codes. There are now currently seven call codes utilized by SFPD, which helps dispatchers crisis intervention liaisons, and sergeants better determine how to appropriately dispatch individuals in response to that specific call. With many professionals developing a larger body of work to support multidisciplinary appro forensic approaches guided by public health um, to address high fr frequency contacts, I would encourage the RIPA board to explore working with the American Psychological Association to develop these dispatch codes in parallel with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. A lot of you know this as DSM. This is especially important as co-response models like medical evaluation teams and alternative first responder models are being deployed that will reveal limitations for sharing data due to HIPAA concerns. I acknowledge that lives and experiences cannot be splintered or subdivided into neat categories, race over here or disability over there. However, we cannot heal what is not revealed. As your data continues to bear out, many individuals who are stopped by law enforcement are greatly impacted by both racial and disability matters. Mental Health America reports that approximately 20% of black Americans are more likely to report serious psychological distress than adult whites. Now imagine the compounding effect of a service call initiated by explicit or implicit bias that goes sideways. It's a self-fulfilling cycle of racial trauma. What is being asked of law enforcement has and continues to evolve very quickly to meet the prevailing needs of our community. Police work is expanding from traditional safety concerns related to bodily harm, property crime, and human trafficking. They are now being asked to respond to calls related to homelessness, poverty, um, excuse me, uh, acute and serious mental crisis, hunger, and wealth inequity. There is no reasonable basis to believe that these experiences are inherently criminal, but prolonged cycles of exposure to these pressures often lead to behavioral outcomes that result in lapses of judgment that are currently being classified as criminogenic. We must engage law enforcement officials who are responding to a call for service to route individuals to recovery pathways that address root causes and reduce justice involvement. In order to ensure that officers succeed in their jobs, and that precious resources are deployed effectively, we must reduce the frequency with which we utilize the back-end law enforcement ap apparatuses to address issues that require more front-end approaches. We cannot arrest and incarcerate our way out of poverty, homelessness, and mental illness. We cannot continue to expect officers to be guardians of safety, social workers, case managers, and counselors. There are many in our community expressing loss and anguish at this time. The resolutions we make during crisis can have great impact. We can choose for it to be a resignation or we can choose for it to be redemptive and restorative. And as your DOG, DOJ colleague Aisha shared me, with me yesterday, the discussions we are having today are painfully rele relevant. And it's more imperative that impacted families with lived experiences are centered in reforms that reduce reliance on law enforcement to respond and transport individuals in crisis.
um, we can make a deeper commitment to uplift, uplift what remains of our shared humanity, demanding that new and more humane ways to replace what we know have been broken for far too long. And um, I'd like to yield the rest of my time to your questions. Okay, so I, I hate to hog all the time. I'm sorry, but Vinny, and, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name properly. Is it Vinley or Vinny? Uh, I go by Vinny. Yeah. Vinny. Okay, first of all, I would like to say your passion is evident. I appreciate you speaking to everybody on this board and everybody in California that's listening because I can see that the, it's very painful. And I also know that what you have experienced with the loss of your sister impacts your family for generations, as well as all the families that have negative uh, impact by these similar deaths. It impacts the children of the children of the children of the children for a long time. And perhaps that's why we're seeing what's going on in our country today. So it's very emotional. I could see it. I can feel it. And, and as I've said before, I'm, I've been there and my family and my sister is impacted by something that happened six, seven years ago. She still is impacted by that. So I want to say thank you for having the bravery to stay, to stand up and say what you're saying. Um, you're right. There's a lot, a lot going on. Uh, police officers 50 years ago were just told to walk down the street and speak to everybody. You know, I knew my, the police officers in my community. The reason I'm a police was a police officer because the police officer took the time to say, I'm disappointed in you. And that made me change. My father whooped me, but the police officer was disappointed. And he made me think about what I wanted to do. And I think based on a San Jose police officer 38, 40 years ago, that's where I am today. We have got to change our relationships. And this whole, what you said, which really hit me because I teach bias, the terms used within bias, loony, crazy, this person's got a problem. That sets the police officer up if it's coming from dispatch. Now, in my experiences over the last 20 years, when there was a medical issue it, that an officer was going to uh, birth, uh, cut, uh, fall down, a critical fall or accident, dispatchers opened a huge book and they read down the line point one two three four what they would say to the person who's calling so is the baby crowning okay let me go to page five this is what you do i don't understand why we don't have and i i've been asking this for a while why don't we have books for that so that a dispatcher has in front of them the proper terminology to use and i think the board as a board member we really need to look at that because loony and crazy have no place on the mouths of, mouths of information that's being dispatched out into the field. Number two, biases, biases, biases deep. It is very deep. Um, we, we've got to change the way we respond. I get that. But again, like I said, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, all we had to do was say hi to the cop and hope that we got patted on the head and pushed on the way. Today, you're asking, we are asking law enforcement officers to be marriage counselors to go into homes of people who've been married for 50 years who are having a problem. And this officer doesn't even have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and we're supposed to go in and fix that. We're being asked to be mental health professionals. And even with the uh, crisis uh, intervention team, that's not enough. Um, it helped my brother-in-law to a point, but then the, the patrol officer didn't have the same training. I appreciate what's happening in San Francisco. And I know I'm, I'm not asking a question. I, I like everything that you said, and it has given us fodder for thought. We're thinking now, why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? Um, because we've got to make a change. And what's going on in this country? And the look in your face right now, the tears in your eyes. You're not the only person. There are thousands of people in California. I, I, I don't know what we can do for the whole country, but right now we can do a lot. And what you have said and what the notes we have taken, Angela and Sahar, we're going to be talking about this stuff. We need to help make changes in our own state. So I appreciate you coming forward. I have notes. Um, I don't know that I have a question for you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I thank thank you for your feedback. I I, I, I can't encourage you enough to really lean on the 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 medical professionals to provide some guidance about how to categorize a lot of what we're seeing. Don't reinvent the wheel, you know, and, and, and there, there is, 
structure is important for for officers. They they rely on structure, but yes. and this structure can be built on top of what's already built. Yes. Um, and and by really listening to impacted communities and really ensuring that these policies are made at 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 the initial conversation, not the end. And and in our preparation call, I made this really clear with I think many of you. You know, we have a real opportunity right now with AB 392. All of these all of these agencies are rewriting their use of force policies, but not engaging in a community process. You are really missing out on an opportunity to reconcile and and restore community and build trust because part of that procedural justice is just as important as the outcome. Yes. And and a use of force policy that's that's brought to a community without any community import is not a reform. I will tell you, Vinny, that what you just said is we need to be proactive and not reactive. That is really important. Um, and so I don't know. I mean, we're on the board. We're going to try. We're you know we're talking about mental health today so that we can put this on our report towards the end of the year so that we can really get involved in all this because what we're seeing in the country today tells us we're missing the boat. We are missing well, the boat. Right, and, and, and what we're seeing is we can't compartmentalize and pretend that we fix mental, mental illness responses without fixing racial trauma responses. They're, wow. they're, they, they, are, they are interwoven and deeply, inextricably linked. I confess that I was one of those people that said, hey, we gotta separate these two because this is a whole nother issue. I know, I got you, I got you, Vinny. I know, it's not. <laughs> I know, it's not. So I'm gonna shut up, uh, Angela or Sahar, if you have any questions, let me get out of the way. Um, I, I just have a few, and then Vinny, I too, thank you so much for being here and for your courage and your compassion and your passion. Um, it's a really honor to have you on this panel with all of us, um, so thank you. And I, I thought, you know, there's so much in, in importance um, that we're going to be able to work with and um, to hopefully really kind of move this forward and make some progress um, as recommendations that the board can give. And so, you know, a couple of things I thought would be helpful for us to hear a little bit about, you know, your experience in San Francisco. And you talked about that, if I understood you correctly, that um, families and advocates and the public were brought into the discussions on the front end for some of the changes that have occurred. And if you could talk a little bit about like what that looked like as other departments may, you know, be wanting to see this as a model or, you know, to be able to, um, you know, learn from um, the lessons from that experience. Um. There, there, there's tremendous wisdom in the communities of impacted individuals. They, okay. they, 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 they embody the impact of, of, of policing gone wrong. Um, and um, I was brought in by a police commissioner, Susie Loftus. Um, she brought me early on in the process to be engaged um, in making the moral case for, for, for maintaining the urgency with overhauling a lot of these policies, so the the impacted families not only provide wisdom, but they are uh, they remind uh, policymakers that we have to overcome the um, what I call the inertia of government, which is things move really slowly, um, but there is collateral damage that happens when we don't overhaul these policies. There's tremendous trauma that is perpetuated when when we don't realize that it's not enough that we measure fatalities. You know, one of, one, of, one of the things that's really heartbreaking for me is we can never really measure how many people we've, we've saved through crisis intervention because there are no data points for that. Emily can probably tell you that, right? What we can measure and what's important, what, what we can measure can help drive um, uh, and support the urgency uh, of of implementing these reforms. So, but but you know, a lot of and and everyone's recovery process from trauma is different. Not every impacted family member is going to want to be involved. You know, it not not everyone heals differently. But for some, for for many of us, after we've recovered from our trauma, we find purpose in participating in these conversations because we know that it it it's in service of 
preventing ha further harm from, from, from being established in our communities. It's part of the restoration process, but, a, and, and so restorative practices are really important. You know, a lot of people talk about restorative justice. It has to be manifest in procedures as well. Um, but there is no linear. I wish there was a simpler answer to you, Angela, mm -hmm. but I think it, it just requires that, um, you know, it could be as simple as, as, as decentralizing uh, civilian oversight meetings so that they're neighborhood based and not centrally located in a government building. Um, it, it can be really small, it can be really small gestures like that that go a long way. Like, but when we think about access and, mm -hmm. and physical access for ADA compliance, we also have to think about emotional access for the, 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 the traumatized communities. Where, where do they feel safe? They may never feel safe in a police station. So if a, if a police station is having a community meeting in their community room at a police station, but the only, the only experience you've ever had prior to attending a community meeting at a police station is to file a police report or to be booked on charges, you're less likely to get a number of people in the community who feel safe enough to come and participate in a community process. So, you know, taking an, a, an accessibility lens in that way is also really important. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I also um, had another question, and, and this is just, I don't know if you have the information um, right now, something we could follow up on, but I was, I'm very intrigued in, in, in both you and Sandra's comments um, about, you know, the dispatch, you know, really starting from like the issue of what the dispatchers, you know, how they're conveying information, and then the, even the tools that we're giving them you know, and in particular, Emily, what you were talking about, how, you know, you're also needing that information to help assess the situation. So, Vinny, you had talked about, you know, this need for appropriate spectrum, I said, you thought of dispatch, dispatch codes, and that in San Francisco, there would be about two that have maybe would be used in many instances um, when these type of situations arise, but now there are seven, and I don't know if that's something that's evolving and there'll be more. Um, but if you have that information, or again, we could follow up with this, um, is what would be like some examples of, of those, um, just to give, make it a little more concrete? Sure, and I'm, I, I'll preface this by saying I'm not an expert in, in police operations. <laughs> but, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, will, I will tell you what I, what I understand it to be. In 2013, when I started participating in these meetings, um, uh, calls for service involving someone uh, uh, mentally disturbed, even the word disturbed is a little um, uh, 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 inappropriate in my mind, but that's not a call that I get to make. Um, that you were either classified as 5150 or 800, right? Like everyone knows 5150. Um, so it was either, um, you know, psychiatric hold and then the, the big bucket of everything else. And now I believe it's, you know, in, in San Francisco, they, they've like segmented 800 to like 800, 801, 802, 803. Okay. And then mm -hmm. 802, 802 to, to highlight specific, it, you know, one may be a barricaded individual, one may be a barricaded individual requiring a crisis response. And so they've, they've added sub designations to 802 and 803, 802CR, 803CR. Um, so basically it, it's just a shorthand for, mm -hmm. for and I, what I mentioned is in addition to um, there's a crisis team at the central operations headquarter uh, for the police department. Um, and then each police station at any given shift has a designated liaison, just like most police stations have a designated terror terrorism liaison that's usually at sergeant level or higher. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when these dispatches are, are sort of d broadcast, um, these liaisons here listen for certain codes. Yeah. Um, and, and they're able to better assess and allocate um, like the human resources of who, who to send to respond to the call. So the example, my, my, in my sister's case, um, one unit was dispatched, but the, a field training officer who was um, uh, uh, riding with a, new, a, a, a newly um, minted officer responded to the call because they heard it over the dispatch, not because they were dispatched to the call. So, and, 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 you know, 
four officers showing up escalated the situation to the point where my sister um, was probably overwhelmed her uh, cycle dissociative schizophrenic disorder to the point where she felt like she was in danger. Mm -hmm. And so what, 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 with, with additional structure to dispatch really helps to refine and limit who is sent to a call so that you have a higher likelihood of a quote unquote successful outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if anybody else on the... Uh... Yeah, uh, Benny, this is uh, Sheriff Robinson, Kings County. Um, ma amazing information that you have. I really appreciate it. Um, one question that I had was, I, I really love the dispatch information and the changes that were made. Do you know, was that shared with POST as kind of an example for them to roll out in their dispatch course? I, I, I have no doubt that it was submitted. Um, uh, Lieutenant Mario Molina is um, an angel sent from heaven, and um, he, he is the, the lead here in San Francisco. He's, he's done um, the tremendous bulk of the work in the last um, eight years. To, he, you know, this program started as, uh, uh, as a Department of One, him, um, <laughs> and, that, and the department has made an investment in growing that his his resources. So I believe they're now a team of 13 at centrally located at, at headquarters as part of field operations. And and when it, when it was first started, he was in behavioral services. So you can also see that 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 organizational change sends a strong signal to the entire department about how foundational that work is. So but, but sorry for the long answer, Sheriff, but that, that I do believe that Lieutenant Molina has submitted this to POST. Okay, I really appreciate that. I think it'd be great for us to follow up on to make sure POST, you know, has done something with that to implement that, you know, as one of their strategies. And, um, you know, I, and Emily, to you, you know, I think the, the program that you spoke about is amazing and I would love to see that everywhere in the state of California. I know that one of the struggles that a lot of us face is, you know, the, the mental health uh, help that we have during the day is Monday through Friday, eight to five, when we don't, aren't getting calls for service Monday through Friday, eight to five for these types of crises most of the time. And so I think um, the more that we we as a board can preach that this needs to be a 24-7 or at least during the vast majority of the time, you know, the weekends and evenings availability and people out there working. Because, you know, I know, you know, speaking from experience, we would much rather have a team of mental health experts helping us on these calls for service than us basically winging it, for lack of a better term, when we aren't experts and uh, quite frankly aren't aren't trained to, to understand how we should be dealing with it and so i think better training on our end but also having more availability is something that we as a board should definitely push for you know going forward so to the both of you i think just your your information today has been amazing so thank you very much and, and if i may if i may share dave the, the bulk of the danger happens uh in trying to transport someone in crisis so you know the service call. I don't. I'm not. I'm not completely aware of of what you're measuring, but there should be an aspect of really analyzing and understanding the dangers of trying to transport someone in mental crisis. That the services should be brought directly to them at the at at the location of crisis experienced, and 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 we should try to reduce and minimize as much as possible the load that's that's carried by law enforcement to transport someone in mental crisis to a facility that's probably not even ideal in addressing whatever crisis they may be experiencing. Yeah, that's a great point. And I'll just share a recent example for us. Um, you know, our, our local ambulance service tried to tried to put us in a poor position of, of, of if they have somebody who was not uh, voluntarily going uh, for a mental health evaluation. They wanted us to basically be the ones to restrain them. And so we had to counter with our own our own internal memo that said, no, we will not be that person for you. We are not gonna be your heavy, heavy person to restrain somebody. So you're spot on. If we can get the services out to them versus trying to, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, force them into a transportation situation, whether it be in a patrol car or an ambulance, that makes the the most sense. So I really appreciate that. Right, and again, an another aspect of that too is that it 
it, the restraint part is the, the humiliating and traumatizing part. That being, you know, being subdued after, in the middle of a, a mental crisis and then being handcuffed is just, it, it further criminalizes the diagnosis and, and further separates the individual from understanding that, that their mental illness is not, is not a criminal behavior. But, but, but the actual physical repercussions uh, would lead them to think otherwise. Yeah, thank you. And so one last question, and, and either or both of you can answer it. You know, as a, a law enforcement person who also has to run the jail facility, how is the, the information when it does involve an actual criminal case then also relayed to the facility staff? Because that's one issue that we've run into where, you know, a local jurisdiction police department makes an arrest in the field and we're not on their dispatch channel. We have no clue what they just went through and they literally bring somebody to our facility that not only had criminal charges, but is probably having a mental health crisis. And now all of a sudden they, they don't share any information with us. Do you guys have some suggestions or ideas or a model by which that that, that can be incorporated into that arrest where an agency has to share information that they have? You know, I can give some feedback regarding that question, sir. Um, you know, we have a correctional behavioral health team that works within our central receiving facility as well as in um, our larger longer term facility. And um, we also at our central receiving have a medical staff. Um, and I'm not sure I, if I'm, I think it's a registered nurse. Um, and they provide a screening, the medical sort of screening that includes questions regarding behavioral health. Um, however, like, like you already stated, a lot of times that information isn't shared. Um, there could be a lot of reasons why maybe, you know, the stigma attached with it and the individual's not wanting to share that or just the overall trauma of the situation going on, being arrested and whatever type of um, action occurred to lead to the arrest. I mean, that's that's a lot going on. Um, but, you know, our, if, if our mobile evaluation team is involved or if law enforcement is aware from prior calls or reports that there might be a behavioral health issue, I know that information is passed on during the booking process at Central Receiving with the staff doing the medical screening. And then, then it, they have a process in place with our correctional behavioral health team to give them the heads up, like, hey, we need you to check in with with this person. So that's the process we have in place. Um, and it, and and again, my, my whole mantra is always going to be prevention. Um, if there's an opportunity to contact a family member of that individual even before an arrest is made, I have no doubt that if if my sister or my mother or my father were called. Um, my sister would be alive today. So, like, we, 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 we the, w yes, it's important to understand the protocol for, for, for the transfer after the arrest, but, you know, we have to keep going way upstream. And one phone call to next, to um, an individual, who can I call that can help us de-escalate this conflict, is going to lead to a better outcome always than arresting that individual. Thank you. Okay, does anyone else have questions? Any other board members? No. Okay, um, now, so Vinny and Emily, thank you so much, both of you, for such powerful, powerful presentations that demonstrate the valuable information that's out there, hearing your experiences and your commitment, and it's, I'm sure, inspiring to everyone who is on the video or on the call today. And so with that, we'll just, um, unless there are any other questions or comments by the board, uh, Sandra and Angela, if you could um, uh, invite the public 
uh, for comments at okay, this time. So Thank you. I will. And you know, I'm going to do it, Angela, like we did it last week. Do we have any members of the public in North in Northern California that would like to speak um, to the board at this time? Anyone in Northern California that's with the public? Nope. Do we have any members of the no. public? Oh, sorry, sorry. I see somebody, I think. Go ahead. Do other board members need to indicate they are on the line? Uh, I got a chat question. Do other board members need to indicate that they are on the line? I think right now it's just um, Sheriff, uh, Day Sheriff Robinson, right? Myself, Angela, and Sahar, we're all board, we're subcommittee board members and board members for RIPA. Is that the only ones we have on line right now? Any, Can any you hear other? Me? Okay, go for it. Apologies for an echo. Just, my name is Lily Kajabi. I'm a new board member, and I just, although I'm not on the subcommittee, just wanted to indicate that I've been listening in. Very compelling testimony. Thank, thank you, Lily. I'm looking forward to public comments, too. Thank you, Lily. I'm sorry about that. We're stepping on each other a little bit. Thank you for announcing. I appreciate it, and I saw your chat question. Thank you. Any other board members, RIPA board members that are online right now that haven't identified yet? Okay. Are there any members of the public in Central California that wish to make a comment or statements? Anybody in Central California? Hi. This is Lisa Serrano calling from Sacramento. Can you hear me? Yes, Lisa, we can hear you. Hi. Um, yes. Um, my name is Lisa Serrano. I'm a California Native American. I'm out of Sacramento, California, and I'm the executive director from The Bridge, which is a Native American organization that advocates for victims of crime. I've been listening to a couple of these meetings, and um, there was something a lady said earlier. I didn't get her name regarding the demographics and the need for the communities in reaching um, their training. Is she there? Is she still there? Um, nonetheless, what I was um, in saying that when it comes to calls to service, we, we are not immune to, to disarray and disasters. I have had a horrible experience when I was younger and with my father and he um, when the police came out and my father was already deceased the first thing they asked us is what happened and what did your mother do and even I know you then as a child that the police officer he's never going to be a hundred percent knowing what to do we are always going to have room for improvement we after the death of my father i rather instead of being angry and hateful i have compassion for the department of justice and law enforcement because, because again, we are not immune. There will always be room for improvement. And this is not, I was surprised at what happened, but then again, I'm not because other countries are going through their, their Department of Justice's um, havoc. I'm just reading my notes here. Right now, our tribe is full of compassion for the Floyd family and for the other states and our nation that has experienced this, along with our heart is full of compassion for what the 
law enforcement is experiencing because this one individual or the ones that don't handle the calls right or the dispatch person who doesn't handle the calls right is not the Department of Justice. It is not law enforcement. Yes, they're there and they get paid, but they are not the core of our system. It is easy to criticize and condemn, but regardless how much training we're gonna have, how much policies and procedures and changes we're gonna have, we will always experience this. We must know to stay focused on, and that's why I'm grateful for this meeting, on focusing on the solution. We have a saying on tribal land that when we have, there, there's no such thing as one bad apple. Because if you put a bad apple in the apple pie, the whole apple is gone. So that means there's a bad apple. So you're gonna pull out it's the root that's bad. But we cannot just stay focused on what, what, what we don't have. And we must strengthen on the areas that we do have. I was privileged to have Cesar Chavez as my history teacher and march with him. And I learned a lot. And a lot of it was having compassion and being as experts, we all, as all experts, I'm a government analyst in Washington, D.C. and I live in Sacramento. But we all as experts must be diverse with cultural awareness. There's gonna be different barriers without being biased, without taking sides. But at the same time, irregardless of the, what happened in Minneapolis, that whole department is not bad. Irregardless of what happened when my father died, that whole department is not bad. I really appreciated hearing Mr. Robinson the other day, where he says, we try to do things and we feel like our hands are tied. And I wanna tell you, sir, that you are doing a good job. And we are not to be disheartened for the work or the, and the performance thereof that it shows us that it's not getting better, but it is getting better. Like it is getting better on Indian country and it is getting better off of Indian country. Ms. Serrano? Yes. Can I ask you a question really quickly? Please do. You're the executive director and I miss of what organization? The bridge. Just the bridge out of Sacramento? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, thank you for your comments. They were beautiful. We really, really appreciate that. Um, thank you very much. Um, do we have anybody else from Central California that wants to make a public statement? Thank you. Do we have anyone in Southern portion of California that wants to make a statement? Uh, yes, please. This is uh, Michelle Wittig. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Michelle, we can hear you. Thank you, yes. I'm with the Santa Monica Coalition for Police Reform. And uh, I'd like to just relate a, a brief experience that I had uh, on my way home from the Citizens Academy one evening, uh, coming up an off ramp of uh, the uh, 10 freeway. Uh, it was very dark and I saw what appeared to be a homeless woman struggling with a shopping cart trying to get it up a curb at a blind turn for the cars exiting the freeway. It was about 9 p.m. <clears throat> so when I got to a place that was safe for me to stop the car, I called 911 and reported this woman in distress who could be in danger of being run over by a car. Uh, later, I looked at how that call was classified and uh, was sorry to see that uh, it was classified as disturbing the peace. Uh, my motivation to report similar observations was undercut uh, when I realized that I might be uh, inadvertently a party to endangering her further. So uh, I would appeal to uh, police agencies to review their classification procedures. 
and uh, see whether they can be improved. Thank you. I am unsure that if anyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. I, I, I take the previous person's remarks and use it as a springboard for mine, even though I did not intend to speak on this. The California Department of Justice instructs police officers who have encounters with homeless persons where they're doing welfare checks. And the person who spoke before was concerned about the welfare of that homeless woman. The, the CADOJ instructs law enforcement agencies to encode those encounters as consensual encounters that often result in searches and that the officers witness the commission of crimes. So that explains, I believe, the issue that that person has and why the instruction of the CADOJ plays an important part in how homeless encounters enter databases. That's an atrocity. Um, I reject any notion that the LAPD can bring any expertise to any of these things. And we do not always have Denzel Washington available to act as an intercessor on behalf of homeless people. I don't know if what I'm speaking of rings a bell with anyone, but um, I refer them all to an article that appeared towards the end of last week or the beginning of this week where Mr. Washington noticed a homeless person in distress there were police all about, and he was the intercessor. And many people believe that he may have saved that person's life. So expertise can be seen as a myth. In that case, it was. Um, more important than anything else that I've heard is this business of the law enforcement personnel in mental health matters. Since quite often, as was the case in Northern California last August, when a department decided not to accept calls for service where mentally ill persons were involved, why cannot the police department simply refuse to do these things? These are not really police matters. It's well established that a person who is mentally ill has a 16 times more likely chance of being killed than in an encounter with police than a person not so impaired. Police quite often decide what kinds of calls they're going to handle. Let this be one of the cases. I think that's all I have to say on this subject for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. Thank you. Do we have anyone else um, that wishes to speak? Northern, Central, or Southern California, members of the public? I think that that portion of the uh, meeting is settled. I don't think we have anything else. Okay, thank you, Sandra. 
and thank you everybody for your comments. Um, perhaps we should now then move on to the board's discussion of um, the proposed calls for service chapter in our 2021 board report. So, and I know that um, we have received kind of a, a general outline um, or some proposals of what um, you know we may want to include. And I think that today's conversation has given us lots to think about. I think we have a lot. We've both Vinny and Emily have given us such great information, and as a springboard of so many things that we may want to cover in um, next year's report. And you know, on this issue, we have calls for service, which have so many subparts that I know that we will want to address. Um, this may be one that we can, you know, and as I'll open it to other board members, I think we have already a lot of good information that we may be able to include, and it will be this continuing conversation in future reports as well. So I don't know if I'll go, I'll um, turn it over to other board members as to kind of their thoughts about, you know, the current proposal of what we might want to include in this aspect, calls for service, part of the outline, following up on what we already included in last year's report and where, you know, where we want to go from, from here. Well, Angela, I, I am overwhelmed with how much information we got today. And uh, I can see some uh, best practices coming out. Uh, a couple of things that I, I love it that uh, Sheriff uh, Robinson, what he had said, uh, asked a question to uh, Vinny. Um, Vinny was talking about the uh, Health and Safety Code 5150 and also individual codes that individual agencies throughout our, our state, if not the country, use different codes for each city. I would love if we could somehow in the state of California be able to come up with best practices where we're using the same mental health codes so that we're not guessing on how we're going to say what we're going to say. Uh, what Emily and Vinny said has really um, given me a lot of things to think about, and I'm going to make a lot of phone calls to dispatch managers that I know up here in the Bay Area. I really appreciate it, but we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. And I, yeah. I apologize that I didn't think it was, I thought we could separate this, and we can't. <laughs> but I do um, think, I mean, if we could at least, at a minimum, you know, it's like the top down, what's happening in a dispatch. I mean, yeah. there's so many um, very significant markers and, and milestones along these calls and this need. But if, yeah, we could start and, and focus perhaps on what is happening in a dispatch and then bringing in how that interrelates with this teams, like Emily's team. And, you know, so right there is a huge topic. Um, to the source of the call. That's where the call comes from. That's the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got, that's where we need to focus on. Sorry, Sahar. No, 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 that's totally fine. So I know that Disability Rights California actually has developed trainings for post on um, how to best deal with callers with mental health issues. And they have an extensive mental health practice group where they have developed recommendations, have been on legislation relating to this issue. I actually propose that we solicit um, an invitation to comment from them, or, or excuse me, not solicit, send them an invitation to comment, because I think that they are experts in this area and have developed training, so I think they can help us outline some of these issues. We got really wonderful recommendations today, uh, and I think it'd be important to hear from them as well. I have some leads there if you want. We can discuss how best to send um, the letter. I can ask who the head of the department is if you guys want. I know who the head of the department is, but who ha would have the expertise there? Is that something you'd be open to? I think that's a great idea. And you know, Angela, I don't want to. I don't want to also forget because it has happened three or four times this past week. The initial reason that we were doing these calls for service um, uh, committee was because of the calls that were coming in throughout the country based on bias by proxy. Right. This mental right. health issue is huge, but that right. is also. Uh, I don't want to now set that back because we've seen examples recently of yeah. people using their privilege to say that someone of color is committing a crime when it's not. Thank goodness for video. 
Um, but there has to be some legislation, some some way, and I think Sheriff, Sheriff Robinson, hopefully you, uh, you will agree with me, these people that are calling the police and using the police as a tool has, become, has gotten